welcome you as we gather together in a different kind of way again for worship and thankful that you are joining with us as you are watching today. Uh, if you are not normally a part of Frederick and you're watching, we especially want to say thank you for tuning in to watch this. And, and we would just invite you, if you're watching by Facebook, to fill out the Google Doc form that's in the comments and just drop us a note. Let us know how we can pray for you, that you're watching, whatever. We, we would love just to be able to respond to you uh, as we are worshiping in this different kind of way today. But I do remind everyone that we are still worshiping the King of Kings. And as we do every time, I want us to think and prepare for this time of worship. And to do that, I want to point you to Psalm 77, and just to hear the word of the Lord. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You're the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. What God is like the one true God. We come to worship him today. So let's prepare our hearts, focusing in on him, that we would truly worship. Join with me in praying as we begin our time together. Father, we give thanks to you that you have brought us to this time where we can worship you. Even though we're scattered across many different homes right now, you have allowed us this time. And pray, God, that our hearts would be directed to you. God, help us to sing, even where we are, to sing unto you. Help us, God, to look to your word and hear it and follow what it says. Thank you, God, for your great goodness and your grace. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
your voice and sing with us. Let your neighbors hear what's going on in your house this morning as you worship together. Holy, 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 man has fallen from thee through the blood of Christ. 
Christ thy Son, this soul can be redeemed. Justice, truth, and mercy join with love to crown me. you just let go of God? How much more if God let go of us? Because of our sin, what if God just abandoned us? What if he relinquished us to the consequences of our sin? Total devastation to say the least. But yet, Scripture tells us that it was His kindness that leads us to repentance. And may we never show contempt toward His kindness. Rather, praise Him for His good. Today, wherever you are, would you just sing out with us, proclaiming His goodness and His holiness. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever.
goodness, Lord, for your kindness, Lord, your grace and your mercy, that honestly, we don't deserve that. But Father, you give it to us anyways. Lord, it's just a privilege to get to worship you. Lord, whether it's in our home, whether it's in the church building, whether it's outside. Lord, I just I hope that we understand how privileged we are to get to do that. So Lord, as Scott comes this morning to, to preach your word, Lord, I just ask that you give him Lord, his confidence, peace, just to know that what you've laid on his heart is what we need to hear. So Lord, I just ask for the next few minutes that what any distractions that we have, that we can put those to the side and we can focus our attention on what you have for us to hear this morning. So we open your word. Um, Lord, we just meditate on that. We just thank you for, for all that you're doing in our lives. Um, we, just, we just thank you for what you're going to do as well. We love you. We thank you so much for your son and what you've done on the cross for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Ezra chapter 9. Over the past few weeks, we have been dealing with a few different passages as we focused on the circumstances that we're in and how we respond to that well uh, as believers. But we are moving back to Ezra, completing uh, that series we've been in, and we're going to be moving to Nehemiah next Sunday uh, so that we can just continue working through the text of God's Word. So let me just take you back to remind you of what we have been focusing on at this point uh, and what we've seen in the book of Ezra. Uh, so the people of Israel had been taken into captivity. They, they'd been taken away because they had turned away from God. And just as the years went on, God's patience endured for a time, but eventually he had them taken into uh, a separate different place because of their sin. And they were there taken in slavery essentially for 70 years in Babylon. But God in his grace allowed them to return so they could be back in the promised land. And so God sent a group of them back into the promised land. And at first they were doing well. They were seeking after the Lord, working to rebuild the temple. But the old ways set back in and they failed to complete what God had called them to do. So God raised up prophets to stir them up and to move them toward faithfulness again. They completed the temple that God had told them to do. And then 50 years, over 50 years pass. And they begin falling back into their, own, their old ways again. And this time God raises up a man by the name of Ezra to lead another group of people back into the promised land to help focus the people of God back on what they are to do, living as God's people. So Ezra takes a group of people back into the promised land, this four-month-long journey that they have. And where we pick up in Ezra chapter 9 today, we're seeing that Ezra has been there for a time, and things have gone wrong again in Israel. They've fallen back into a sin that has plagued them for centuries. And what we're going to see as we look at the passage today is we're going to see Ezra as really a model for us. A model for how we respond to sin and how we look at it in our own lives. You see, we we all need models to help us understand how to do things and how to live. Uh, I remember being a kid and I I had certain models that I looked up to that I, I really hoped I could be like. So I grew up in the era of Michael Jordan being the greatest basketball player, and and I just remember watching Michael Jordan play, and I just thought that if I practice enough, I could be like Michael Jordan. Uh, So he was my model. I I aimed my shots so that they would be like he shot. I I hoped that one day I could dunk like he dunked, but that never uh, quite materialized. So uh, I had that model for that. But I also remember being a kid and, and really just looking up to my dad and my grandpa. I remember them modeling for me some things about what it meant to be a man. And I remember them modeling for me uh, just simple things as a boy, like how to hunt, how to camp, how to fish, things like that. You see, the reality is is that we do need models. Models to show us 
how we're supposed to handle ourselves and how we're supposed to respond. And in this, as we're going to look in Ezra chapter 9, we see a model for how to repent of sin. And you may be sitting there right now and you may be wondering, do we really need that? Do we really need an example of what it looks like to repent and to handle sin? And the answer is that we absolutely do. We, we need someone to show us what that really looks like because our human tendency is to see sin for less than it really is, to see it in a way that is less than what it actually deserves and to see it in less than how God actually sees it. So turn with me to Ezra chapter 9 today as we look to consider this situation in Israel and how Ezra responds to it. Ezra chapter 9, I'm going to read all the way through the end of this chapter. After these things had been done, the officials approached me, and this is Ezra speaking here. The officials approached me and said, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations. From the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons. So the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, and this is is Ezra's prayer. Oh, my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within this holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery, for we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the king of Persia to grant us some reviving to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you have commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying the land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons. Neither take their daughters for your sons and never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved, and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice the abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. You know, as we think about Ezra as a model for us here, I want to show you three things that we learned from Ezra, particularly three things in response to how, how we see sin and how we are to respond to sin. And so number one, what we learned from Ezra here is that sin is serious. Sin is serious. See, Ezra is approached by some of the leaders of Israel. He's only been there a few months now in the land of, uh, of Jerusalem. And these leaders who come to him, approach him and tell him that the people of Israel have been mixing with the peoples of the land. And if you look at verse 3 uh, there of chapter 9, it says that, that the, uh, the holy race, verse 2, the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. But 
before we move any farther on this, I, I want you to understand what this is not. What Ezra is saying here, what the leaders here are saying, is, is that this is not a distinction by race. Because the word here that's used is a word that means literally seed or offspring. This is about God's people marrying unbelievers who would lead them into idolatry. You see, God had given the people of Israel a command hundreds of years before. Do not intermarry with the pagans of the land because they will lead you astray into their idolatry. But what did Israel do? They intermarried with the people of the land and they were led into idolatry. Really, the classic example of this is Solomon. Solomon started out as the wisest king, but he ended up with hundreds of wives and hundreds of wives from other lands. And what happened was they turned his heart astray and eventually idolatry crept more and more into the land of Israel. So this is not a reference to race specifically here. Let me be clear on that. There is absolutely zero place for racism among God's people. God's purpose is for all races, all the nations of the world to know him. The situation that is here in this passage is about the seriousness of sin because the people of Israel had directly disobeyed God's command for them. They'd gone against what God had said. And so I want you to hear what Ezra says about what they had done. Just listen again just to the words that Israel that Ezra uses about the people of Israel and their sin. This is Ezra praying to God. He says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift my face to you, my God. And this is how he describes what they have done. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. Uh, just notice the very language that he uses here in describing what they have done. I mean, he uses the language of iniquity and guilt before God. I mean, this is, this is a little different than sometimes the language that we use to describe the things that we've done wrong. Uh, sometimes we soften the blow of the reality of our sin because of the way that we describe it. We, we, we use things like uh, saying, I made a bad decision, or I, I messed up, I, I had an improper relationship, I had a lapse in judgment, I, I made a mistake, I, I crossed a line. But those aren't the ways that Ezra describes what the people of Israel have done. He, he says that they are guilty. He's identifying them, says we're guilty. Our iniquities reach up to the heavens. So think about the way he describes that here. They're, our sins are higher than our heads. They go up, up to the heavens, higher than the heavens. I mean, these ways that sometimes we describe our own sin as oh, we messed up, I, I crossed the line. I, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. You know, we, we almost describe it as just small messes that we make. I, I, I remember watching one pastor talk about this, and, and he described it as sometimes we look at our life as just these, these little messes that we make. And I, I know what messes are. I, I live with two little kids, and so I see messes all around me. For, for whatever reason, we can go into our kitchen and we can clean our kitchen floor, but a day later, it, it looks like somebody has taken cookie crumbs and crumbs from cereal and just launched it everywhere. I, I really don't understand how it's possible to make that much of a mess over just two or three meals. But it happens with little kids. And, and sometimes we look at our sin almost as those little messes that we make uh, in our kitchen that kids do. That we can just sweep it up a little bit. And then we can throw it away. And we just can sweep it up just that little bit, and then it's gone. But the reality is, is what Ezra is pointing us to here, is that our sin is so much deeper than that. He, he doesn't describe it as these small little things. He describes it as sin as high as the heavens. Why does he see it that way? Because that's the way God sees it. That's the way God views sin. God is holy, 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 like we have sung. He, he will never see our sin as just a small, minor thing, as us just merely crossing a, a boundary that we shouldn't have. He will always see it for what it is. Verse 13 tells us, this, this, is, this is the description of what sin is. 
and after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds, and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this. Just the way Ezra describes it here shows us the seriousness and how repulsive sin is to God. If you go back to verse 7 of this chapter, what Ezra does is he briefly just recounts the history of Israel. He, he just says, uh, from our fathers, going back to, to Abraham, th- this has been a sin that the people of Israel have struggled with, that there has been mu- much guilt. And he's speaking about the thousands of if- different ways that Israel has failed to follow God's commands, that they, they have not done the sacrifices the way God has told them to, that they have failed to care for the poor like God has commanded them to, that they have worshipped idols and followed those pagan ways and because of that sin god removed them from the promised land sent in invading army to take them out to lead them into captivity and and that's what verse 7 says that they were handed over to the kings of the land And, and the summary of what happened to israel here in just these couple of verses doesn't even begin to describe the depth of the horrors that happened to them as an invading army took them away and slaughtered them and those who were left were basically slaves in a foreign land but going back to verse 13 though even even after all that they experienced in the horrors of that invasion and that captivity Ezra says that God has punished us less than our iniquities deserved. We've experienced less than what our sin actually deserves. Because in the eyes of a holy God, all sin is heinous. It is utterly evil. Worse than anything we could picture, imagine, or describe with our own words. So really the question becomes for each of us. Do we see sin in the way that God sees it? Do we see our sin for the reality of what it is, this kind of seriousness? And I ask you, just right where you are, right where you are watching right now, please do not gloss over this question. We we humanly tend to downplay our sin. We have this tendency in our heart to see our sin as not nearly as bad as it really is to see it maybe in terms of the past tense rather than our present sin and so i ask do you see your sin as iniquity before god reaching higher than the heavens as as evil in god's eyes so then asking that question then the next question becomes how do we respond to this kind of view of sin How do we respond to this kind of seriousness when it comes to the issue of sin? Well, again, Ezra serves as a model for us. Because then this leads us to the second thing we learned from Ezra. Number two, sin demands a serious remorse. Because sin is serious, sin demands then a serious remorse. So again, Ezra serving as a model for us. I want you to listen again to how he responds in verses 3 through 5. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head, pulled hair from my beard, and I sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the return to exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. He sits there all day long. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn And I fell upon my knees, and I spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And he begins to pray at that point. I mean, just think about what he does. In light of the seriousness of sin, he he rips his clothes. And he pulls out the hair of his beard and the hair of his head, and he sits on the ground, and he doesn't get up. And finally, after probably hours of being there, he gets on his knees and lifts his hands in prayer to God. Now, that might seem a little over the top to us. I mean, just to to think of ripping your clothes and 
pulling out your hair. I mean, have you ever pulled intentionally hair out of your head or from your beard? It, it hurts. <laughs> we, we think that, well, he's going a little too far. Ezra, don't, don't you just need to just chill out a little bit? Just realize that God is a God of grace. You just need to let this go a little bit. But let me pause for just a moment here and, and remind us that, yes, absolutely, God is a, a God of grace. And Ezra and all the people of Israel who were gathered back there in the promised land, they had experienced that. They had experienced God's grace by them being allowed to come back into that promised land. They were slaves taken away. And God in his goodness and grace brought them back. But that does not mean that God was overlooking their sin. It is possible that we would so emphasize grace or so think about grace that we would miss the seriousness of sin or that we would miss the holiness of God. And again, please don't get me wrong in what I am saying here. Do not miss what I'm saying. Yes, absolutely, we believe in God's grace. This past Sunday, we celebrated Easter, and Easter points us to God's grace, the power of God. And Jesus being raised from the dead so that we might have life in Christ, death being defeated. This is all God's grace. But Easter itself also reminds us of the cross, Jesus dying, which points us to the seriousness of sin. That Jesus died because of what sin is. And for us to remember that just one sin by Adam wrecked the whole world. And threw the whole world into this brokenness and sin. So yes, absolutely, God is full of grace. And we sing and we remember the amazing grace of God. But at the same time, we must never overlook the seriousness of sin. And so I would ask you, right where you are sitting, right where you are watching at this moment, how do you respond to sin in your own life? Do you ever find yourself with really just a flippancy toward the sin in your own life and, and toward the things that you do wrong where where maybe you, you almost write it off by saying that my my attitude really wasn't that big of a deal. But it, it was just one thought that I had. Or really, that's just my personality. Or it was really just one glance. It, it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, do you ever find yourself just justifying what you've done wrong and you, you say well I, I was angry because of this and you fill in the blank you ever just really just kind of overlook it and so looking at Ezra here maybe maybe an appropriate question for us thinking about him as a model for us is when was the last time that we were broken like what we see from Ezra here when was the last time we were broken like this because of our sin? With just weeping over the sin in our life because of how evil it is in the light of how holy and good God is. Now again, don't get me wrong in what I'm saying here. If you are in Christ, your sins are dealt with. Christ paid that penalty on the cross. You, you, you don't bear that penalty anymore because Christ bore it. And if you're not in Christ, if you have not trusted in Christ for salvation, you can. You can have yourself, your sins dealt with once and for all, completely forgiven, so that you will bear them no more. But when we see our sin in the light of God's holiness, in the light of how good He has been to us, doesn't it, doesn't it cause us to grieve? to weep over our sin and to think, how could I do this in light of who God is? And so when was the last time that our sin led us to this kind of deep grief and remorse for our sin? So Ezra is showing us here. He is modeling for us. He's painting a picture of what this looks like. And it, I mean, this wasn't even his sin. This was the sin of the people of Israel around him, the sin of some of the leaders of Israel, and yet he just is grieved over it because of what sin is. So then this leads us to the third thing that we learn from Ezra. 
The third thing we can learn from him as a model for us, and that is that sin requires real repentance. Listen to what happened next as we move into chapter 10. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly as they were realizing their sin. And then in verse 2, And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra, We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. So the people are recognizing the seriousness of their sin, and they begin weeping because of it, out of this deep remorse. And Shechaniah, one of, one of the men who came back with Ezra, stands up and identifies what that sin is, that they have given themselves in marriage to these people who are not followers of the one true God. And so because of this, many Jews had become unfaithful to following God alone. So what are, what are they going to do in light of this? Are, are they simply going to do nothing? Just be sad about this happen and, and then go on about their day? No, they are going to repent. They're going to turn away from their sin. This is what we see in the next verses. Follow along, it's starting in verse 3. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and those who tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law, according to what God's word says. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as they had, as had been said. And so they took the oath. Now, before we go any further in this, we need to understand that this is a unique situation in the time period of Israel as Israel was under the Old Testament covenant. The Old Covenant, the, the Old Testament law. Now, like today... Believers are not to marry unbelievers. But as we look at the New Covenant, the commands of the New Covenant, the New Testament, we see specific commands about believers not divorcing an unbelieving spouse, except in unusual circumstances of abandonment and infidelity. So as we look at this passage, there are some unique things that apply to Israel and how they were responding to their sin under the Old Testament law, under that Old Testament covenant. But here's how this applies to us. As we think, how do we learn from this? Well, here's how Ezra serves as a model for us and for the people. See, they don't merely feel remorse for their sin, but they repent of their sin. They turn from it. In fact, a recognition of our sin, of the seriousness of our sin, would lead naturally then to a real remorse for our sin and then real repentance from that sin. Charles Spurgeon said this, basically, that just uh, goes along with everything that we've been saying. He said, quote, Repentance is a discovery of the evil of sin, which is what we've said, right? It's seeing that seriousness of sin. But then he goes on to say, after we're seeing the evil of sin, it's a mourning that we have committed it. Just like we've seen in the passage here, this deep grief, remorse over sin. And finally, he says, repentance is a resolution to forsake it. And that's what we are seeing here in this passage. Paul tells us the exact same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. He says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. You see, it's possible to have a worldly grief, just a feeling that is feeling bad about sin or feeling bad about getting caught or about displeasing someone. But godly grief, the kind of remorse that we're talking about here in this passage, this, this sense of grief for the sin, leads to genuine repentance, turning away from that sin, no longer doing that by God's grace. So then all this comes together then, and how do we respond to sin in our lives? So it, just thinking personally about this for each of us, 
Is, is there some sin that you've allowed to remain in your life? Is, is there something that you've let be hidden? Perhaps even that you have nursed or allowed to just kind of secretly think about in your mind? Or some sin that you've seen as no big deal and perhaps you've just excused it? Maybe there's something that God is bringing to your mind right now. Now, obviously, this is a pretty heavy sermon, dealing with some pretty heavy topics. But as we think about this, let us now move and end with God's grace. Because absolutely, God does forgive, and God does provide grace for us. You know, we've just come through Easter, so we've been focusing on God's grace with that. The very fact that Jesus came to earth to live the perfect life that we couldn't, and to die on the cross for our sins. That, that is all grace. That our sins may be forgiven. Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, shows that to you. And so, believer, know that there is grace for your sin. Christian, if you've been redeemed, the penalty for your sin is paid for in full. And then also know that there is grace for you to put to death the sin that is in your life the things that you're still battling, struggling with. Take seriously your sin. Hate it. Seek to put it to death. Don't be satisfied with it in your life. If you're struggling with a sin that, that, see, that keeps popping up for whatever reason, talk to another trusted believer about it. Talk to one of the pastors about it. Don't let it hide in darkness. God gives grace for you to put that to death by the power of the Spirit. And then you are listening now who have never followed after Jesus. I do want you to understand that there is grace from God for your sins to be forgiven. For you to turn unto Jesus and confess your sin and ask for forgiveness and believe that he paid the penalty for you and know that it can be com forgiven in full, completely, and that you can know him for eternity. And then I would say also, it's often the case that God has worked most profoundly. And God has brought revival when his people have been convicted of sin. May that be the case with us, that God would convict us so much of the seriousness of sin that we have this real remorse that leads to a real repentance and may it even be that in this time of difficulty that we're going through now, that God would convict us and that he would work this genuine remorse and real repentance in our lives and that he would use that to bring a real revival that is not just here in our church, but that is throughout churches all across this land and that he would pour that among us because he brings us to this real repentance. We're seeing sin for what it is and seeing him for who he is. So let's go to him now in prayer. Our great and good God, we come before you remembering that you are holy, 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 and that there is none like you, and that our sin is grievous to you. And so we pray, God, that, that you would cause us to see that sin for what it really is, and so that we would hate that sin and turn from it, and to turn to you in repentance but also remembering the grace that you give through Christ for our sins to be wiped away in full. And the grace you have through the Holy Spirit working in our lives for that sin to be put to death so that we no longer keep going back to it because we are new creatures in Christ if we know you and are in Christ. So thank you for that great truth. And we remember that and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship, we generally continue through giving of offerings as a part of worship, and we would take that at this moment. But in this different time that we're in, we're saying that we pass the digital offering plate and inviting you to partake in worship in that way uh, through online giving or mailing in your offering to the church. And again, I just say thank you for those of you who are just continuing so faithfully to be involved in that aspect of worship and supporting the ministry here. And then finally, I, I would just simply say that uh, if you need anything, if you would like to speak to a pastor or speak to someone else, we are here for you. 
you can still send us a message through Facebook. You can fill out that Google Doc that's on the, uh, in the comments of the Facebook uh, post that we have here. Uh, you can send an email to the church at help at frederickboulevard.com, and we would love to be able just to respond to you and help in whatever way. So I pray that as you go on throughout this week, that you keep your eyes fixed on the Lord, that you walk by faith as you seek to follow him. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week.